Hi everybody, my name's Jeremy. I'm a game designer on the World of Warcraft team, and welcome to our live stream for Rise of Ashara. We've been working really hard on a lot of content. Uh, so recently, you know, we, we unleashed Tides of Vengeance, and we unleashed Patched 815, tons of content there, increases to our stories outline, we fought the Battle of Dazar Alor, and we got the Kul Tirans and the Sandalari on our side, but now is finally the time when we get to talk to you a little bit about our next large content update that we only gave you glimpses of back at BlizzCon. So, super excited to get into everything. Let's go ahead and jump right in and start talking about Rise of Ishara. Just to set the stage for you really quickly, to catch you up on the storyline, we defeated the battle for Dazar Alor, King Rastakhan fell, Mechatorks on ice, and everybody retreated. After that, we got the Kul Tirans and the Zandalari as our allies and their last remaining ships. And then just recently, just this week, you picked up a brand new knife friend and unlocked the ability to see what was underneath the Shrine of the Storm in the Crucible of Storms. And of course, next week, many of our bravest champions are going to take the fight down there, and the consequences of that are what's going to ultimately launch Rise of Ashara. So where are we at with the story? Well, Sylvanas has learned something, and we're not going to go quite into what that is, but what ends up happening is she sends some of her most powerful champions, like Lorthamar and Nathanos, out on her flagship and with some of the few remaining ships out to sea. The Alliance sees this and immediately seizes the opportunity and begins chasing her forces. Jaina at the helm of her own flagship. And it's at this time that our third Warbringer finally plays her cards. The seas will open up beneath us and our ships fall and shatter on the rocks below. And we find ourselves in this strange new land that has recently seen air for the first time in tens of thousands of years with Nazjatar. But we'll get into all of that in a second. First, let's take a look at the high-level rundown of everything coming at you in Rise of Ashara. We've got two brand new zones, including the formerly underwater zone of Nazjatar and the lost technological island of Mechagon. We're going to be raiding as Shara's eternal palace and having a confrontation with Queen Ashara herself. We're also going to be heading in to the city of Mechagon on Operation Mechagon, a mega dungeon with eight bosses. We also have a brand new system with the Heart of Azeroth that we're going to be talking a lot about today. In addition, Rise of Ashara has a host of additional features, which include new quests, spanning Magni and the War Campaign, that span all across Azeroth and contain a wide variety of different locales, people to meet, and things to interact with. We've got two Heritage Armor quest lines for the Gnomes and the Tauren, as well as two brand new islands with Crestfall and Snowblossom Village. And we'll be experimenting with heroic warfronts, starting with the battle for Stromgard. But that's not all. We've also got a variety of other features that hit up just about every player type in the player base. For PvP players, you got a new arena with the Robodrome, and Ashran is returning as an epic battleground. For everybody, you'll unlock flying with Pathfinder Part 2, and we'll be talking about new items called Mount Equipment. Season 3 is coming with its item level increases, and we'll have mission updates with new missions and mechanics. Of course, holiday updates including a revamp to Brewfest, some war mode specific content, brand new profession content, and new pet battle content. There are a lot of things coming in Rise of Ashara. Now let's take a quick look at our first zone, Nazjatar. Nazjatar is this gorgeous, formerly underwater area that includes both these beautiful wildlife areas of kelp and coral, as well as the ancient night elven civilization of the city of Zinishari that was ruined and sunk long ago. You will also make your way down deep into the deepest parts of Nazjatar, where you'll find the Naga-held fortifications. This is our first time showing the deepest parts of Naga architecture that leads all the way up to the Eternal Palace itself. Now we're doing a few new things out here in Nazjatar. First, one of the ways that you can level up your power in Nazjatar is through a system we call Combat Allies. When you head down into Nazjatar, the first thing that you're going to notice is that Ashara has laid a trap for you. 
and we're going to have to skirt a huge Naga army and find our way through dripping caves and caverns to try to avoid her forces until we gain some more power. Most of our troops are dead or dying after the catastrophe that starts this whole experience. Down here, both sides are going to meet brand new allies. The Horde are going to meet a group of former Naga slaves made up of the Gilblin, the Makura, and the Sea Giants. They call themselves the Unshackled. And the Alliance are going to be helped out by a group of deep water warriors called the Ankoan. Both sides hate the Naga for a variety of reasons, and we're going to help them build up their bases in order to attack back. One of the ways that we can build up our forces here is with our combat allies. This is a system where you can take out one of three different allies to head out with you to adventure during the day. Combat allies can gain experience by completing world quests, killing rare spawns, or doing some of their own daily quests that will unlock whenever you take one of them out with you. As you level up your combat ally, they will gain new abilities and eventually unlock other cosmetic rewards for you. You have three different combat allies you can take out in an Agitar with you, and they each have 30 levels. So there's a wide level of different progression that you can get just from questing down here in Nazdatar. But it's not all about bringing a buddy out with you. We're also making some changes to how we view world quests and daily quests in this zone. Nazdatar will have an emissary, but all of the world quests are heavily themed around Ashara and Nazdatar itself. If you see a rare spawn or a rare elite world quest show up, it is a Naga champion sent by Ashara. It has a powerful Ashara-related affix, so every time you see it, it's going to feel a little bit different to fight. They also take over an area and bring with them base defenses. This is one way in which we want to make it feel like all of these champions, when they come down into the world, really have an impact on their area. You'll also find other world quests that are unlocked here through a series of quest lines related to the former denizens of Zinishari. These are just some of the ways that we're trying to change up how the world quest system works in this area, and we'll talk about other ways that we're doing in Mechagon in just a little bit. Another one of the things that we're focusing on is taking a lot of those background activities and putting them around your hub as sort of a daily system where you can log in, you can gather some quests that will have you performing a variety of different kills and collects and other activities around the zone before you head out to adventure for the day. So you can always feel like you're being efficient, but also everything comes back to building up this hub and building up our forces so we can take the fight to Ashara. The main quest line of this zone takes us through building up these guys and then getting down deep into the Naga areas and figuring out what exactly is their weaponry, what are their defenses, and then how do we counter them. Ultimately, we're going to have to make our way over into the city of Zinishari and gain a powerful artifact called the Javelins of Suramar. We're going to use this in a climactic finale that breaks open the entrance to Ashara's Eternal Palace. So let's talk a little bit about that in a second. But for now, let's take a quick look at a video of Nash. The Nazjar experience, of course, culminates with us breaking into Ashara's Eternal Palace. This is an eight-boss raid, and does actually, in fact, contain a purely underwater boss. He's this giant undersea monstrosity creature that snakes in and out of dark holes down in the deeps. We feel it really gets across that sense of delving into the deepest and scariest parts of the water where Ashara has her Eternal Palace. Of course, there's going to be brand new loot and items to be gotten here, and it all culminates with a climactic final battle with Queen Ashara, the likes of which is possibly going to change the future of Azeroth. Here's a quick look at the interior of Ashara's Eternal Palace.
But the undersea city of Nazjatar isn't the only place we're going to be going in Rise of Ashara. There is also the lost technological island of Mechagon. Heading out to Mechagon, we're going to learn that there is a small town shown here in the lower right of Rustbolt. Rustbolt has long been fighting against the tyranny of King Mechagon, who lives inside of the walled city. King Mechagon is building a doomsday device. His great goal, and the goal of all of the Ark Forged, these heavily mechanized gnomes that live inside of the city with him, is to turn everybody back into robots. Of course, we don't want that to happen, so we're going to be helping out our beleaguered friends down here in Rustbolt. First, we're going to help them rebuild a little bit of their city, building up new mailboxes and base defenses. Then we're going to help them rebuilding a little bit of the island. One of the cool things we're trying to focus on here in Mechagon is making it all about building and tinkering. So you might notice that there are construction projects scattered across the entirety of the island. These are projects where you and other players can come together and use some of the resources that you gather by scavenging and scrounging around Mechagon in order to rebuild powerful structures that give you an advantage on the battlefield. You may have a powerful boss standing in front of you right next to two destroyed flame turrets. If we all come together and repair those, taking down that boss and completing our quests is going to be much easier. As mentioned earlier, we're also going with a slightly different questing structure here in Mechagon. In addition to all of the great main quests and the side quests that are going to kick off from there, we've also got a visitor system. If you built an inn back in your garrison, you may have seen something like this. Three highly thematic visitors are going to visit Mechagon every day. Each of them brings with them changes in the spawning of the zone and a special daily quest for you to help them out. Helping out all three of your visitors every day is one of the best ways to get your Mechagon reputation up, but it also gives you an awesome reward. And that's one of your main endgame loops for Mechagon, while almost everything else is very open-ended and find it at your own pace. You may be able to build a mechanical cat, only to find that you can then collect nine paint colors for it from a variety of different activities. You may start building a crazy robot that turns out ending up being a giant awesome spider bot mount after you put in a little bit of effort into it. This and a variety of other outdoor activities await you in Mechagon. Similar to Nazjatar, Mechagon will also be featuring a timeless isle-like rare spawn system. When you see one of those stars show up on your minimap, it will often be one that you don't see very often. Some of them have longer spawn timers. Some of them are very rare or have odd or different or secret ways to get them to spawn. And you know that when you see one of those stars on your minimap, it always has something awesome on its drop table. Or at least, you have the potential of getting something awesome, unless you already have that mount. You'll see that system incorporated both here and in Nazjatar. We feel like it makes exploring the endgame pretty exciting to be able to see those again. So let's take a look at the exterior of Mechagon Island. Oh, actually, hang on one second, real quick. Uh, so just getting a little bit further into the crafting and tinkering aspects of Mechagon Island, one of the things that you're going to be doing is building up this guy. This is Pascal the Robot. Pascal is a new system that we have implemented that allows you to collect schematics from questing and adventuring around Mechagon and then build him up further. This is one of the ways that you're going to be specifically building up your hub. You can then gain the scrap and batteries that you gain around Mechagon to build a variety of different things here at Pascal. So this way, it allows you to unlock a whole lot of different things over the course of your adventure and build them yourself. Very tinkering, very mechanome focused. Uh, as you can see here, some of the cool things you're going to be able to get from Pascal include the ability to transport immediately back to Mechagon, a Mechanocat laser pointer that gets you the aforementioned Mechanocat mount, and a variety of different powerful consumables. You may even want to stop here at the beginning of the day and pick up some electroshock grenades before you head out to Nazjatar, because they're pretty powerful. All right, I said it before, but now we can actually do it. Let's take a look at Mechagon City.
So we're going to have a lot of fun out of Mechagon. There's a lot of cool mechanics out there, a lot of things to collect. But ultimately, we're going to have to, at some point, come in and stop King Mechagon and his doomsday device. So in the dead of night, you and the Rust Bolt Resistance are going to make your way around the Junker Wastes. You're going to take out his hunter-killer robots and bust your way into Mechagon City proper. That is Operation Mechagon. This is a double-sized, eight-boss dungeon that culminates with a climactic battle in King Mechagon's lightning-shrouded tower against his giant death robot. In Operation Mechagon, you will be making your way up through the trash compactor like any good gnomish operation does, defeating the giant trash compactor robots, and then up into Mechagon City, shown here. The Mechagon City denizens aren't exactly friendly towards us, and they're not going to welcome us. In addition, the city itself has been weaponized against you. You'll see machine guns popping out of hedgerows. Nothing here is exactly our friend, so watch your back. Ultimately, you'll make your way all the way up to King Mechagon himself. Operation Mechagon contains some awesome new loot, new drops, and all kinds of crazy mechanome activities. Let's take a quick look at Operation Mechagon. <laughs> Mechagon contains an awesome new trinket as well. You're going to pick this up during your early questing, and you can get advancements for it through both questing and the Mechagon Mega Dungeon. This is the pocket-sized computational device. This is a customizable trinket where you will get punch cards of the yellow, red, and blue variety that you can mix and match and collect all of and socket them into your pocket-sized computational device, making the trinket that's right for you. We feel like this is a fun new way to explore trinket design and we're really looking forward to your feedback on all of the different punch cards for your device. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about the fate of the world and the heart of Azeroth. When we last left off, Magni and Mother were determining how best to start healing the planet. Unfortunately, since then, things have gotten worse. Giant wounds are opening up all over the world, and we don't have a good way to heal them. In addition, they have detected that titanic essences are beginning to leak out of Azeroth. Now, the titans imbued their power into all kinds of different things, into uh, automatons like Mimiron and the Titan Keepers, into the planet itself and certain structures, into the dragon flights, and we're finding that all of these essences of the titans are no longer clinging to Azeroth the way they once did as the planet is dying. So these titanic essences are starting to coalesce all over the planet, and they're very powerful. So what Magni and Mother are going to do, alongside us, the champion of Azeroth, is rebuild the Chamber of Heart. Here we see the rebuilt heart chamber itself, and we will also gain the ability to build a brand new structure in here called the Heart Forge. Here next to me, you can see the Heart of Azeroth socketed into the Heart Forge. Doing so unlocks the ability for the Heart of Azeroth to absorb these essences and gain great amounts of power. In doing so, we'll be able to finally start sealing up some of these wounds and making some progress in terms of healing Azeroth. But what does this mean for gameplay? What does it really mean to socket and slot an essence inside of your Heart of Azeroth? Let's take a look. When you first unlock the Heart Forge, you will gain the ability to slot essences into this constellation-like structure in the Heart of Azeroth. The first slot you will unlock is the big golden one in the center. And as you continue to level up the Heart of Azeroth, you'll unlock all of the remaining nodes in the constellation. Unlocking the large slot in the center allows you to slot a essence, shown here on the right-hand side, into it. This grants you a brand new artifact level active ability. This is a powerful new ability that your character gains, depending on which essence you have slotted there. As you continue gaining power, you will gain two additional slots that are minor slots. 
These are shown in the lower left and upper right hand corner of the constellation. Slotting an essence into a minor slot gives you a passive bonus. The slot in the center, the major slot, is the slot that gives you the big active bonus. Essences themselves have multiple different types. We want you to feel like you have a variety of different active abilities that any of your characters can choose from as you collect all of these essences. This gives you a huge amount of customization. Any one of these essences slotted into a major slot will grant you both the major power, shown at the top, and the minor power, shown at the bottom. Any of these essences slotted into either of the two minor slots will give you the minor passive power. This way, you can change your character's active and passive powers depending on what you happen to be doing for the day, what boss you're fighting, or what other situation you're running into. We want all of these to feel like awesome abilities for every character. Essences also come in a variety of different ranks. You can obtain a higher rank of an essence without having the lower rank of the essence. It's not the essence itself ranking up, but they come with the ability to collect a number of different ranks of them. As you get a higher rank of an essence, that essence may not necessarily get simply a damage boost, but you may see other utility elements, the addition of charges, and a variety of other things. The complexity of your decision making about which essence to use when is going to increase as you collect more and gain higher ranks of them. Now for those of you players that get really, really into the system, really like mythic raiding, top end PVPing, there is the top level of essence shown here on the right in legendary orange. If you're able to obtain the top level of an essence, you gain a dramatic cosmetic appearance change. When you fire off that ability, everybody will know that you've been able to obtain the legendary rank of that essence. Now, collecting all legendary ranks of all of the essences is going to be pretty difficult. Essences come from a variety of different things in World of Warcraft. You can get them from questing, from raiding, you can get them from uh, doing outdoor activities and getting uh, reputation, you can get them from dungeoning and from PvPing. If you want to collect everything in the essence system, you're going to have to do a lot of different activities. And maybe you'll find that doing one particular activity helps you work towards one essence, getting you a lot of agency in how you want to progress your character on any given day. We think the essence system is very exciting. It gives you a huge amount of customization for any character and a lot of things to go out and collect, similar to artifacts. We're really looking forward to your feedback on this system. And we know this is a lot to take in and a lot of tooltips right now, so we've actually got a blog post coming out at the very end of this presentation that will explain much more of this in detail. Moving on, let's talk about our other features of Rise of Ashara. So, you'll get to go on a very gnomish quest line that goes into the history of the remaining family of Mechgeneer Thermaplug in order to unlock the gnome heritage armor. Here's a final shot of the armor, lots of awesome nuts, bolts, and lights, and a very cool pair of goggles. Perfect for taking into Mechagon. For the Horde, the Tauren get this very Thunderbluff, very Mulgore feeling heritage armor set with totems and feathers, lots of awesome pieces here. The Tauren will be going on a spirit journey with the spirit walkers in Mulgore and Thunderbluff to figure out what's going on and why are the spirits restless, why now, and why in Mulgore. Now, my Tauren friends, unfortunately, we're going to have to solve one tiny loose end before you can go on your heritage armor quest line, and that is the war campaign. All of the decisions that Sylvanas, Jaina, Gen, Anduin, all of the leaders, even Sorrowfang, have led up to this moment. Chained up beneath Orgrimmar is Bane. And we're going to see what his fate is, and really, what the fate of everyone in that group is, in the next chapter in our war campaign story. Really excited to hear what people think about this. Moving right along, uh, we will be introducing our very first Heroic Warfront, starting with Battle for Stromgard. So when we were approaching Heroic Warfronts, one of the things we wanted to make sure it felt like was not simply a 20-minute-long boss fight. There should be a dramatic difference between a Heroic Warfront 
and doing a raid boss. So one of the things we've been heavily focused on is the strategic layer of heroic warfronts. If you played StarCraft II or WarCraft III, you may have remembered missions where the enemy started sending huge waves of very different units to different locations and having to divert your forces and in some cases hole up inside of your city and defend in order to take the fight back to them. We're going to be introducing many of these mechanics into the battle for Stromgarde. You will see particular attack waves in areas where you are weakest, and you will have to determine amongst your raid who's going to head back and defend as you risk losing. You'll also need to determine how you're going to funnel your resources in order to best combat the units that they're sending at you. And you may even see the enemy commander periodically take the field take the fight to one of your locations, only to teleport out with their group once they're at a certain percentage of health. We're really excited to see what you think about this. We feel like it plays dramatically different than any of our raid boss fights. Next up, for P players that enjoy PvP, take the fight to the mechanical arena in Mechagon called the Robodrome. The Robodrome contains the whirring and clanking gizmos and gears that you would expect of a mechanical arena with some awesome new line of sight blockers and great visibility for arena fights. PvP players will also welcome the addition of a brand new epic battleground. Welcome back to one of the most epic battlegrounds of all time, Ashran. Ashran will be joining the Epic Battleground Bucket. Welcome back, Ashran. We've got two new islands coming in Rise of Ashara as well, the first one being Crestfall. Now, Crestfall was a Warcraft 2 map, so you're going to be seeing elements of lore, especially if you've recently played Warcraft 2, scattered all around this island, such as this beached giant turtle that the goblins, of course, used as their submarine, which you first got access to on this map. Long ago, of course, it decayed and died, and now it's home of some crabs and probably some hosen and a variety of other creatures. Uh, new humanoids for this group include some ghost orcs, and will, of course, have new item drops and pets and mounts and all kinds of other fun stuff. Uh, and just uh, a little bit of a different feeling, we're going to the quiet mountain town of Snow Blossom Village. This is uh, inhabited by the Pandaren, who are currently under attack not only by undead that you see here, but the ever-present menace of the hopping bunny-like vermin. It's going to be your new humanoid group for this island. If you're a fan of islands, both of these are awesome spaces to explore. With Rise of Ashara, of course, comes the second half of the Pathfinder achievement and the unlocking of flying. Once you unlock Pathfinder Part 2, you will be immediately granted this gorgeous mechanical parrot mount for your efforts. as well as the older areas. We think that unlocking flying in these areas is going to feel awesome. Once you've flown around the Naga Caverns, yeah, I don't know if you're going to want to fly in any other zone. It's a lot of fun to navigate. So let's talk a little bit about mount equipment slots. Uh, we have a ever-present problem, which is that there is one mount that is incredibly powerful, especially for leveling and especially if we're about to head down into a zone that has you know, like puddles and streams and stuff. And that's the Water Strider. The Water Strider has innate water walking, which makes it very useful for anybody. But not all of us want to roll around all the time on a bug mount. So we will be introducing a brand new item and equipment slot called Mount Equipment. This equipment slot is on your character. And once you apply a piece of Mount Equipment to it, all of your mounts will receive this benefit. Some of the pieces of mount equipment that you can apply to your character in Rise of Ashara include a saddle chute that gives you an automatic parachute when you jump down from too high of a height. If you're an explore player that likes exploring, you may like that. You can also get inflatable mount shoes that grants water walking to all of your mounts, so you no longer have to use your rotter strider necessarily, unless you really enjoy it. And the comfortable rider's barding, which can prevent all of your mounts from being dazed. We feel like the mount equipment slot is an awesome new way to allow you to pick whatever mount you want in whatever context. And we'll have more information to share once we hit the PTR. Next up, let's talk a little bit about brand new season. Season 3 is coming at you with Rise of Ashara. Brings with it, with the PvP season, a brand new set of vicious mounts shown here, the vicious basilisks. And of course, brand new arena gladiator mounts. And the Mythic Season will bring with it, of course, the usual item level increases, as well as a Nazjatar-themed affix. 
Along with Season 3, we'll be unlocking the Eternal Palace Raid and the Mechagon Mega Dungeon and all of the great rewards, loot, essences, and collectibles that you'll find in there. Let's talk about those collectibles for a second. Here's our awesome loot picture. Here are some of the things you'll be able to pick up in Rise of Ishara. On the left hand side here you see not much else to say here. It's awesome. It's a giant wheel. It's a big wheel mount. It's very exciting. And next to that, one of the battle pets you'll pick up in Mechagon, this tiny little mechanical gnome bot. He has a variety of different heads, including one that's a siren. So this is essentially Mechagon's Alarmo bot. We brought it back again. Always have to have an Alarmo bot. It's a very gnome thing. The crab mount that we mentioned at BlizzCon has gotten finalized in all of its final anims, and man, it looks amazing. Down in the deepest areas of Nazdatar, of course, there's some creepy undersea critters to collect for the pet battlers. And if you were a fan of Warcraft 3, you may have been wondering this entire time what happened to those remaining Naga units, the Tidal Guardian and the Snapdragon. Well, I'm happy to announce that you'll be able to see them using Tidal Guardians down in Nazjatar. These giant snake creatures shoot lightning and will be tameable by hunters. And the Snapdragons will also be showing up, shown here on the right hand side, as an obtainable mount in Nazjatar. There are a lot of great features coming at you in Rise of Ashara. Here's a quick recap of everything that's coming. Two new zones, a new raid, a new dungeon, and a brand new system with a ton of new active abilities and customization. A great amount of new quests spanning all over the planet and some major lore characters. Two heritage armors, two islands, a heroic war front, a new arena, the addition of Ashran to the epic battlegrounds, Pathfinder Part 2, Mount Equipment, Season 3. We're also adding new missions and mechanics as mission updates. Brewfest is getting a giant makeover and now has a pretzel hat and an eating contest with holiday updates. We're building some content that is specific for war mode that we think you're th going to think is really cool. Also some new professions and of course new pet battle content including the Strathholm Pet Battle Dungeon. Lot and a lot and a lot of awesome stuff coming in Rise of Ashara. So naturally, we want to get this in your hands as soon as possible. But we wanted to wait and make sure that the majority of the content was going to be there and playable for you. We want to get your feedback on everything. And that means that things need to be, they needed to be ready. And that meant that we were holding off the PTR for a while until the content was essentially at a place where we were ready for your feedback. But most importantly, we wanted to make sure that the Heart of Azeroth and Essence system was in place immediately. We want you to be able to jump into the PTR right away, unlock your essences, and immediately begin playing with them to give us all of that great feedback that we're looking forward to with more than enough time for us to be able to respond to all of your comments. Well, I'm happy to announce that we feel like we're there. And you will be seeing PTR first start to hit the servers next week. Really looking forward to everything that you're about to see. Of course, we all look forward to the giant data mining explosion and all of the awesome pets and mounts and other things and broadcast texts and quests that you're going to read. Uh, so we'll be looking for all of your reactions on the forums. And of course, when you're able to jump into PTR, we will have a ton of this content playable as well as that essence vendor waiting to immediately sell you some essences so that you can start playing with them and start giving us feedback about how this brand new heart system feels. We've put a lot of time and effort and heart into Rise of Ishara, and we think it shows. There's a lot of really cool stuff here that changes the game in a lot of different ways. So we're really looking forward to your feedback. Thank you very much for watching our live stream. I'm Jeremy Fiesel. On behalf of everybody on the World of Warcraft team, we'll see you in Rise of Ishara. Thanks.